Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Thomas Church, Fifth Avenue, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to those of you who are joining us around the world via the live stream, over many years, St. Thomas has been blessed by the presence of some fine theologians in residence. And it's been my joy this past year and a little bit to be working with someone of international reputation in the Reverend Dr. Luigi Gioia, and many of you have got to know him. And uh, I think taking theology seriously, as Father Austin used to say, is part of the um, culture of St. Thomas Church Fifth Avenue. And Father Gioia has produced for our bicentennial a wonderful series of historical lectures. So I'm going to hand over now to Father Joya, and uh, I hope to see some of you in church tomorrow. Don't be lazy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Father Carl. I'm not sure about the international reputation at all, so <laughs> be uh, warned. A very warm welcome to you all, and it's a really uh, um, a great joy to um, uh, carry on with these uh, bicentennial historical lectures. As you know, we are celebrating the bicentennial of our community, which started in October 12, 1923, when three Episcopal parishes in Lower Manhattan, Grace Church, Trinity Church, St. George's Church, assembled to found a new Episcopal Church in New York City. And I think it's very important that the Bicentennial is not just an occasion of um, remembrance, but uh, as always, history is there to help us to think about the uh, future. So you all have the uh, brochure with the, uh, the series of lectures, um, and I hope you will take part um, in all of them uh, in the coming month. Now, uh, for today, uh, let me start with something which I never thought I would make this connection in, in a context like this. But I still lived in the UK two years ago, before I came here, when uh, the uh, President Biden pronounced his inaugural um, speech for um, when he became president. And I... I was following, I've been passionate about American politics since I was a child. Um, when I lived in Italy, for some reason, I uh, followed everything, etc. And uh, so I was listening to, live to the, to the speech. And at one point, there was this sentence, you probably remember it. Many centuries ago, said President Biden, Saint Augustine, a saint of my church, wrote that a people was a multitude defined by the common objects of love. A multitude defined by the common objects of love, of their love. Now, this is, I've been, you know, I specialized in St. Augustine. I recognize the sentence immediately, and uh, I think uh, it's, it's really the secret of what it means to live uh, um, peacefully and fruitfully in civil um, society. And as you know, our speaker today uh, contributed uh, to write the draft of that speech. Now, I don't know if this sentence came from President Biden or came from uh, John Mitchum, but what I know is that everything I've read uh, by John Mitchum, everything I've seen him saying in interviews and podcasts, really uh, expresses or uh, embodies what is in this sentence. However, many good reasons we might have to disagree with others, we have much more things we cherish and share. And to live together in a society, we need not just shared interests, but focus on the things we love. And we can discover that the things we love unite us more than the things we disagree on. So it's a, it's a really great pleasure to have someone who knows St. Thomas very well, uh, almost needs no introduction, because John Mitchum 
um, not only is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, the author of dozen of books, and I, this is one of my favorite, the American Gospel, and I'm so proud because it was now inscribed by him, so I'll cherish, <laughs> I'll cherish this forever. Um, but also was a communicant of St. Thomas Church from 1996 to 2012, served uh, for six years in the vestry in St. Thomas, preached on the 10th anniversary of 9-11 and on the departure of our previous rector, Andrew Mead, and delivered the Good Friday meditations on the last words of Jesus in 2013. And having done this last year myself, I know how gruesome is as an experience in terms of the energy it requires to um, deliver it. So we are really, really thrilled and excited to have Professor John Mitchum here, who is going to talk uh, about St. Thomas in War and Peace, to keep the feast. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor John. So, thank you, no, no. So that was very generous, uh, Father, and I was standing there thinking maybe it's just not quite fulsome enough. Um, and my, my, as, as the Lord does, one, one becomes humble. Uh, I was reminded of a moment, probably 15 years ago now, I was on the Washington Mall at the uh, National Book Festival, and I was on my way at that point to give my talk about Andrew Jackson. And a woman ran up to me, which doesn't happen enough, um, or ever, actually. And she said, oh my God, it's you. And I said, well, yes, you know, existentially speaking, that's, that's hard to argue with. And um, I live in Tennessee, so I have to leave the state to use existential as an adverb. Uh, so thank you all. Um, and she said, I just, your, your books have meant so much to me. I love them. I'm going to go, will you wait right here? I'm going to go buy your new book and have you sign it. Would you wait here? And I said, yes, ma'am. And I stood there thinking, this is the way the world is supposed to be, right? Women run up to you. They buy your book. It was a twofer. <laughs> Hand to the Lord, she brought back John Grisham's latest novel. <laughs> so whenever I think I am the most important anything, I remind myself that somewhere in America, there is a woman with a forged copy of The Runaway Jury, <laughs> right? Because I signed the damn thing. Uh, that is a true story. The second part is also true. I'll, I'll inflict on you. That was a Saturday, and the next day was a Sunday, and I was on my way to uh, Maine to see George Herbert Walker Bush and Mrs. Bush. Uh, I was George H.W. Bush's biographer. It took me 17 years. It was supposed to be posthumous, but the son of a bitch wouldn't die. <laughs> um, I'd bring it up. He'd say, not going to do it. Um, remember that voice? Uh, Dana Carvey once said, the key to doing the old man's voice was Mr. Rogers trying to be John Wayne. It was a perfect description. <laughs> and for some reason, it was just the three of us at lunch the day after the Grisham uh, mishap. And that, was, uh, that almost never happened. Uh, Bush world was like a wasp Epcot. Uh, Gorbachev would be in the kitchen. The Oak Ridge boys would be on the putting green. It, it, it was Billy Graham would be uh, hitting tennis balls. It was a very weird world. But... For some reason, it was just the three of us. And I told this story about being mistaken for Grisham. And I will confess to you, uh, in the presence of, of the reverend clergy, that it was an entirely transparent attempt to get either the former president or the former first lady to say, oh, you're so much more important than John Grisham, right? So I had cast the fly out on the water. And Barbara Bush looks across the table and says, what? how do you think poor John Grisham would feel? You know, he's a very handsome man. <laughs> so, it was a bad weekend uh, for me. Uh, I am honored to be here. This was uh, a parish, this is a parish I have long loved. Uh, I was first here on uh, the Nativity of Our Lord in 1993, uh, 30 years ago, I just realized. Um, uh, John Andrew was the, uh, the rector of blessed memory. And as, as uh, Father Joy just pointed out, uh, it became our, uh, our parish for a long time. My children were baptized right over there in the Chantry Chapel. And uh, 
I will say that being on the vestry of St. Thomas Church Fifth Avenue makes you realize that Anthony Trollope wasn't as creative as one might think. <laughs> he just wrote what he knew and edited out the more improbable parts. Uh, we had marvelous, I'm sure this is no longer true, uh, Father Turner, but we had personality clashes and battles over things like, you know, the height of the candles, you know, important matters. Uh, and uh, it was, I, our children were very young. And in, in those days, I don't know if it's true in these, we met on Wednesday mornings at 8 a.m. That was the vestry meeting hour. And it turns out that when you have small children, that's actually a fairly crowded hour, which I didn't know. Um, and so I would come to the vestry meeting and my wife would have several children to deal with. And so she was complaining on one occasion to my Mississippi mother-in-law about the uh, fact that I was coming to St. Thomas instead of helping you know, feed my children, the small matters. And my mother-in-law won my heart forever by saying, uh, you know, honey, if y'all lived down here, he'd just be off shooting ducks. So um, <laughs> there we are. Um, I um, want to talk about the role of St. Thomas. Historically, yes, but the thing I would like you to, to bear in mind as we, as we walk through this is history is a living thing. It is, the past is another country, but it's a very porous border. And there are an enormous number of lessons that we can learn. To me, history is a conversation between the living and the dead in an attempt to shape the lives of those yet unborn. I think that is, that is a, it's, it's a river, it's a stream, and we, if we fail to consult the past, it's not as though the past is a GPS system, right, where you can just type in, I would like democracy to be saved, and you take two left turns. I use that advisedly. Um, are you all awake? Okay. Um, uh, and you, therefore, something happens. But it is the only data set we have in human affairs is history. And it may or may not be dispositive, but it would be irresponsible, it seems to me, not to consult the one evidentiary treasury we have, and that is the past. Our faith, your presence here, is a suggestion that at least to some degree you share the view that acts of remembrance are vital. This is a living place, but it is founded on the act of remembrance. And remembrance is not a passive exercise. It's an act of agency in our tradition. So that's, I'd like you to bear, bear that in mind. We talk about the life of the American nation, the life of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church as manifested in this place that has meant so much and means so much to so many. Aristotle taught us that the particular can shed light on the universal, and I hope you'll find these informal but heartfelt thoughts illuminating as we make our way through what George Eliot called the dim lights and tangled circumstance of the world. Now, when I have the privilege, and, and Lord knows it is that, a privilege and a gift to speak in a sacred setting, I always bear two old stories in mind, one from my native South and one from my old friend, the priest and rector, Andrew Mead, to whom, along with John Andrew and, and Robert Stafford, I, I owe so much. Um, the first is never be overly dramatic when you're speaking in a church. And there is a, um, it's difficult. Uh, because it's the great story about the preacher who said one day, as our Lord said, and rightly, okay, uh, uh, the parish in which I grew up in uh, Tennessee, there was a, the, the rector was the future bishop of the diocese and his curate, <clears throat> excuse me, his curate at the time was also a future bishop. 
one morning at the eight o'clock eight o'clock service. <clears throat> Excuse me, Luigi, can I get some water, please? I'm sorry. <clears throat> or turn some wine into water, whatever you want to do. Um, our tradition's about reversal. Um, eight o'clock service. The young, uh, the young curate really throws himself into reading the off. I mean, really just lays into it. And they get back to the sacristy afterward, and the rector says, you know, son, just read the office. You didn't write this stuff. Uh, <laughs> so that's one. Uh, the other is from John Keeble of the Oxford Movement, who t- advised young preachers, don't try to be original. It is the gospel. Just preach the gospel. And so I, I will uh, attempt to, to, to do that. Now, Much of what I'm going to say here I have said in some forums uh, in the past and will doubtless say again, unless, of course, the kingdom of heaven arrives before lunch, but that seems unlikely, though we know not the hour. In the event the kingdom of heaven does not come before lunch, here goes. In war and in peace, in chaos and in calm, St. Thomas Church has forever borne witness to the centrality of the gospel of Jesus Christ with its demanding, thrilling, puzzling, powerful, frustrating, elevating message that in this world of tribulation, we should be of good cheer for our Lord has overcome the world. And this parish has done so by being steady amid swirl, sturdy amid storm. It has kept the feast, and so therefore it has kept the faith. In his final song, Moses stood once more before the people of Israel. The promised land lay in sight, as does the water. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The future was at hand. Deliverance was just steps away. And yet the great prophet at that hour, with so much right at hand, spoke not only of what was to come, but of what had been. Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will tell thee, thy elders, and they will show thee. Remember the days of old. Like Moses, we believe in remembrance. Not remembrance in the sense of sentimentality, and least of all for nostalgia but remembrance as an act of witness and an act of agency. From the first Passover to the Last Supper, our ancestral faith is rooted in remembrance, in acts of commemoration, and in a recognition of the living sanctity and unfolding dignity of every individual human life. So let us remember. At the time of the dedication of St. Thomas in 1824, James Monroe was nearing the end of his second, his second term as President of the United States. The campaign to succeed him was underway, pitting Andrew Jackson of Tennessee against Henry Clay of Kentucky, John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts, and William Crawford of Georgia. You all have not had William Crawford of Georgia thrown at you on a Saturday morning in a long time. In Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, a newspaper published a poll showing that Jackson was in the lead. And according to John Quincy Adams' diary, he dined with John C. Calhoun. For our purposes, Bishop William White offered this prayer at the dedication of St. Thomas. He prayed, we are assembled to lay the first stone of a building intended if God should prosper the undertaking to be hereafter consecrated exclusively to the duties of devotion. Hereafter consecrated exclusively to the duties of devotion. That the intended building may contribute eminently to eternal interests. Let us invoke the blessing of Almighty God. Now White's presence at that ceremony links this parish in which you sit at this hour to the earliest hours of the American Republic. White was the first presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church in the United, Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America, taking office in the same year George Washington took the oath of office as president, not far from here, down on Wall Street, as the first president. Now, religion and politics 
have the most complex of histories, but they are inextricably linked, for both are about the human enterprise. One of the great achievements of the American founding was the assertion and defense of religious liberty, which includes the right not to be religious at all. Now, a totally secular public square is, I believe, an impossibility. Our task is to manage and marshal religious belief in the service of liberty and democracy. As Homer said, all men need the gods. To push against the religious instinct is to pick a fight that cannot be won. This must be managed and marshaled. Along with most other Christian denominations, the Episcopal Church failed to cover itself in glory, to say the least, in the mid-19th century debates over the existence and expansion of slavery. The rise of pro-slavery theology is a grim and regrettable chapter in the life of the church. And we do ourselves no favors by pretending otherwise or skating past the culpability of our forebears in the durability of human enslavement and later of racial segregation. New York was no exception. One could be, and many, many were, racist and pro-union. Now, to me, the moral utility of history is not to be self-righteous in retrospect. It's not to condemn the past for its derelictions, but to confront those derelictions honestly and straightforwardly in the hope that the knowledge of human folly and vice in years gone by can equip us to do better and give us hope for years to come. We can only become who we ought to be if we know who we have been. Through the great trials of the 20th century, particularly the world wars, St. Thomas stood watch, providing solace for the soul and constant reminders that we are commanded to love God and our neighbor. It is a radical message, a vital message, and it's the essential message for if we do not see each other as neighbors, but as rivals or worse, as enemies, then it will prove impossible, impossible, in the words of the psalmist, for brethren to dwell together in unity. Through those wars in the 20th century, wars against autocracies that put their own power ahead of all else, ahead of the virtues embodied in this place, the virtues of love and sacrifice and grace, St. Thomas Church has stood in this great temporal city a visible gate to an invisible order that we are called to make real. How? How can we make these things real? One means of grace, not the only one, but a crucial one, and I use that word crucial advisedly, are the sacraments of our church and the music. Lord, yes, the music. For St. Thomas is an essential architect of how one makes a truly joyful noise unto the Lord. I, like many of you, am a sacramental Christian. I am a terrible Christian, which in some ways is redundant. I am a sinner. I fail far more often than I succeed. <clears throat> but I am sacramental, not least because of St. Thomas. In the hurly-burly of this city, in the hurly-burly of my young life in the world, this nave, that chapel, kept me tethered to a reality in which I believe, but which could and can seem maddeningly distant, can't it? What is that reality? It's the reality of angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. It's the reality of a risen Lord. It's the reality of love in a world far too often given to hate, to appetite, to ambition, to pursuit. 
This tethering, the tethering I experienced here, is a great gift of the Anglo-Catholic tradition. And no matter one's churchmanship or church personship, I guess we should say, this tethering has been a critical mission of St. Thomas for two centuries and moves forward still. We are adherents of an ancient tradition amid a culture that moves ever faster, a culture that reflexively prizes the new over the old, a culture where the will to power is more prevalent than love of neighbor, a culture more broadly devoted to what's on the screen than to what's sacred. And so, at least for this layman, a question naturally arises. By what means might the heirs of the apostolic tradition make the word and sacraments of the church relevant in a world driven more by tweets than by tractarians? The only time those two things have ever been in the same sentence. <laughs> I have one possible answer to my own question. I am a historian who tries to make something new and resonant out of the elements of the past. <clears throat> I believe deeply that William Faulkner was right when he said the past is never dead, it isn't even past. And that I, we do in fact believe, that live, we do in fact live in what Chesterton called a democracy of the dead. As the faithful people of God, among the most important and indeed radical things we can do is to do what we are doing now, to remember, to keep the feast and say our prayers, to keep the candles lit and the lanterns burning, to read the office and sing the hymns. We have been relevant, I believe, in direct proportion to how well and how faithfully we have carried forward that which shaped and suffused so many souls through so much storm and strife, from that desperate, confusing hour in the upper room until this noontime, 2,000 winters and a world away from that Passover in Jerusalem. For remember, the sacraments are outward and visible signs of inward and spiritual graces, and they are the necessary reminders of how we are to live once we have risen from our knees and gone out onto Fifth Avenue and beyond, of how we are to be with one another beyond that rose window, of how we are to love one another when the incense has faded and the notes of the organ have, for the moment, only come to live in memory. Then, 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 it's in the after moments we are better equipped, better armed to live and to love, to feed the hungry, to care for the widow and orphan, to clothe the naked. Why should we do these things? Because the boldest course we can take is to contemplate the oldest piece of good news in the Christian story. The oldest piece, the oldest thing we have. He is not here but risen. He is not here but is risen. And when we act together to make gentler the life of the world, when we do unto the least of these, we're doing so unto him, unto him who is risen and who will come again. Now, for many of us, the mass is the center of faith, for it is always there, devout or distracted, ecstatic or gloomy, we are told to obey the commandment to do this in remembrance of me. And in so doing, we are mysteriously but unmistakably in communion with God the Father through the sacrifice of God the Son by the working of the Holy Ghost. No matter how we feel, no matter what kind of day or week we've had, our thirst is satisfied and order is restored to a broken world, if only for a moment. Flannery O'Connor in 1955 described attending a dinner party of New York intellectuals at Mary McCarthy's house. The evening dragged on and ultimately the talk turned to the Eucharist. A lapsed Roman Catholic, Mary McCarthy said, 
Ms. O'Connor wrote, when she was a child and received the host, she thought of it as the Holy Ghost, he being the most portable person of the Trinity. Now she thought of it as a symbol and implied that it was a pretty good one. Miss O'Connor then related her reaction. I then said in a very shaky voice, well, if it's a symbol, to hell with it. That was all the defense I was capable of, she said. But I realize now that this is all I will ever be able to say about it outside of a story, except that it is the center of existence for me. All the rest of life is expendable. It is unfashionable, tragically so, I think, to focus too much on sin and shortcoming in mainstream theology, in mainstream culture. When the Episcopal Church reformed its Book of Common Prayer in the 1970s, it dropped a key phrase from the general confession of sin, one that acknowledged there is no health in us. But John Henry Newman, also known as the one who got away, <laughs> wrote a very different kind of prayer of humble access. And I think we can learn more from the words of a dead Victorian cardinal than from the revised confession of our own time. Before Holy Communion, Newman would pray, Thou seest not only the stains and scars of past sins, but the mutilations, the deep cavities, the chronic disorders which have been left in my soul. Thou seest the innumerable living sins, living in their power and presence, their guilt and their penalties which clothe me. Yet thou comest, thou seest most perfectly, yet thou comest. Through the Mass, he comest everywhere to all sorts and conditions of men, and thank God for that. The Anglican monk Gregory Dix wrote a prose poem to the Mass once. It bears reading in its entirety. Of the command, do this in remembrance of me, Dix observed, was ever another command so obeyed? For century after century, spreading slowly to every continent and country and among every race on earth, this action has been done in every conceivable human circumstance, for every conceivable human need, from infancy and before it to extreme old age and after it. From the pinnacles of earthly greatness to the refuge of fugitives in the caves and dens of the earth. Men have found no better thing than this to do for kings at their crowning and for criminals going to the scaffold, for armies in triumph, or for a bride and bridegroom in a little country church, for the proclamation of a dogma or for a good crop of wheat, for the wisdom of the parliament of a mighty nation, or for a sick old woman afraid to die, for a schoolboy sitting in an examination, or for Columbus setting out to discover America for the famine of whole provinces or for the soul of a dead lover, in thankfulness because my father did not die of pneumonia, because the Turk was at the gates of Vienna, for the settlement of a strike, for the son of a barren woman, for captain so-and-so wounded and prisoner of war, while the lions roared in the nearby amphitheater on the beach at Dunkirk, tremulously by an old monk on the 50th anniversary of his vows, furtively by an exiled bishop who had hewn timber all day in a prison camp near Murmansk gorgeously for the canonization of St. Joan of Arc. One could fill many pages with the reasons why men have done this and not tell a hundredth part of them. And best of all, week by week and month by month, on a hundred thousand successive Sundays, faithfully, unfailingly across all the parishes of Christendom, the pastors have done this just to make the holy common people of God. It's amazing. In a letter to a goddaughter on the occasion of her confirmation, C.S. Lewis laid out a practical understanding of the power of sacrament. He wrote, don't expect, I mean don't count on and don't demand, that when you are confirmed or when you make your first communion, you will have all the feelings you would like to have, all the feelings you would like to have. You may, of course, but also you may not. But don't worry if you don't get them. They aren't what matter. The things that are happening to you are quite real things, whether you feel 
as you would wish or not. Just as a meal will do a hungry person good, even if he has a cold in the head, which will rather spoil the taste. Our Lord will give us right feelings if he wishes, and then we must say, thank you. If he doesn't, then we must say to ourselves and to him that he knows best. For years after I had become a regular communicant, I can't tell you how dull my feelings were and how my attention wandered at the most important moments. It is only in the last year or two that things have begun to come right, which just shows how important it is to keep on doing what you are told. To keep on doing what you are told. That is true in this place, and that is true out there. In both the Second World War and after the attacks of Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, St. Thomas had a special kinship with the British, the noble people who stood in the breach against the Third Reich while Americans were slow to the fight. Dr. Brooks, the mid-century rector, was honored by King George VI for his services to the people of the United Kingdom. Under Father Mead, we played a not dissimilar role in 2001. As you will see, grief is the price we pay for love. Quotation from Elizabeth II. And so it is in 2001 that I'll begin to close. In those days, we loved one another as we would be loved. How many of you were in New York City on September 11th? Remember? The restaurants were empty, but the diners and the bars were full. You took a moment, didn't you, an extra moment, to say something to the doorman. Your eyes met your neighbors. We rescued the wounded, so few of them, for the destruction was so total. I was at Newsweek then, and we sent the news comes, and we sent young reporters to the hospitals, and there was no one there. We mourned the dead. We comforted the living. It was an act of war. The question then is still urgent now. Why? Why do the innocent suffer and the innocent die? We ask and we ask and we ask. And yet we live amid enveloping mystery. It is cold comfort. But it is nonetheless true that our faith was never supposed to be easy. It was born in heat and in slavery, in captivity and persecution and pain, in a fallen and fragile world. Now you and I can argue about the details of the American response to the attacks of more than two decades ago. We can argue about the tactics and the wars and the politics, the decisions. But the power and the glory of this republic, of which this parish is a part, lie precisely there in the freedom to argue and to grumble and to disagree, and ultimately in the freedom to hope that our arguments conducted within history can shape history. As Luigi pointed out, St. Augustine once wrote that nations are defined by the common objects of their love by the common objects of our love. And I will report to you all that I spend as much time as I can urging the President of the United States to swim the Tiber and join the Episcopal Church. <laughs> it has not been successful. And frankly, we don't have the numbers in swing states to make it worthwhile. <laughs> so get out there and knock on some doors. What do we love in common? Not enough. That's for damn sure. As Americans, as the people of St. Thomas Church, we should love the wondrous paradox that out of the many come one and that our shared strength is rooted in the diversity of our souls. And this is not homiletic, right? That, that this is not 
something to put on a needlepoint pillow. This is the reality of history. If we do not recognize each other as fellow citizens, as fellow human beings, if we do not see each other as neighbors, democracy does not work. It does not work. Now, when I talk about neighbors, I know that reminds you possibly of Mr. Rogers, right? I want to tell you a quick story about a very small category called great tweets. It's like French military victories in the 20th century. It won't take a long time. Sorry. There's nobody, nobody French here, right? Um, oh, hey. Rappelé la dette de guerre. Um, we appreciate Lafayette. Um, who actually came to the United States not long after St. Thomas was founded. About six months ago, someone tweeted out that if Doris Kearns Goodwin and Mr. Rogers had had a one-night stand, I would have resulted. <laughs> now, I thought it was great. Father Rector, forgive me, Doris was kind of pissed off. Um, she called. She said, couldn't Mr. Rogers and I have fallen in love and you were the product of our union? I said, no, sweetheart. He picked you up in the C-SPAN bar. Um, <clears throat> like America, Christianity demands critical, loving, and constant attention. And St. Thomas Church is a place where critical, loving, and constant work is undertaken. The feast is kept, the candles are lit, the gospel is preached, and the story unfolds. Ever since we came east of Eden, we've sought a rock and a refuge. And for me, it's largely in moments of love that I glimpse the divine. Those fleeting glimpses in the eyes of my children, most of the time, I have teenagers, the brush of my wife's hand and the selflessness of a friend's kind word, those are what I see when I look through St. Paul's glass darkly. To whom much is given, much is expected. And you and I have been given so much. Not long ago, I was at the National Cathedral in Washington at a meeting, a uh, gathering of uh, clergy from around the country. And understandably, uh, one of the uh, priests said, how can I deal with what's happening in the country? What can we do? What's my message? And I said, you have the ultimate message. You do not need to lament, you need to lead. You have the answer. In this world ye shall have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. It is the ultimate story. It may not be dispositive in the temporal realm, but it's what we have. And if you all are anything like me, every day of your life is a battle between what Lincoln called the better angels of your nature and your worst instincts, aren't they? Right now, you're thinking about your Super Bowl bets. You know you should be listening to this, you know, but you're thinking, oh, I wonder what's for lunch. Right? It's okay. The key is 51% of the time, can we do the right thing? The rector may disagree with this. I think if you get to 51%, that's a heck of a good day. So why would the country be any different? Because the, a democracy is the fullest manifestation of all of us. We cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And the way to get to the good is to remember this story. We've been given everything. The promise that amid the dust and the death and the dread, among the broken and the brokenhearted, 
we shall never be separated from the love of Christ? I'll take that. Our traditions about reversal is part of its power, I think. It's not about denying the realities of life, and it's not about escaping into fairyland. It's rather about acknowledging the inevitability of historical crisis and affirming the hope of ultimate renewal. It's about enduring in the confidence that what we've been promised, that the gates of hell shall not finally prevail, is in fact true. It is a tenuous promise in a tenuous world, but it's what we have. It's all we have. Not magic, only mystery. Not magic, mystery. Magic is of men, corruptible. Mystery is of God, incorruptible. Love incarnate, love universal, love unconditional. Sometimes the things in front of us are the things we notice the least. Have you ever thought about this? The central symbol of Christianity, the thing before which we kneel, is the cross. It's not an empty tomb. It's not a discarded shroud. It's the means of execution. It's not the glory, it's the pain. Tragedies ever before us. And so is hope. A final word. I don't need to tell you that we're living in democracy's hour of maximum danger. I am not a Democrat. I am not a Republican. I live in Tennessee, so when I say I have conservative friends, that's redundant. <laughs> but there are parts of Fifth Avenue that are not contributing to the health of the Republic. St. Thomas Church is, but there are buildings not too awfully far away, and I'm not talking about the university club. <laughs> which still has a kind of a mediocre Sunday brunch. <laughs> not talking about that one, a few more steps. Ours is an age of declining trust and growing extremism. The spread of lies and the erosion of truth the premacy of an impulse for brute power, and a deadly dearth of compassion. This is not a partisan point. It is an observable reality. It's not hyperbole. It's the fact of the matter. And yet here's another fact. From the beaches of Normandy to the rending of the Iron Curtain, from Harriet Tubman to William Wilberforce to Alice Paul to John Lewis, we're our best selves when we build bridges and not walls, when we act out of generosity and not greed, and when we lend a hand, not when we point fingers. In such moments, America gets much right, and honesty compels us to admit that we also get much wrong. How could we not? We're the sum of our parts, and the parts, if you're me, is sinful, selfish, and self-satisfied. Robert Louis Stevenson once said, the duty of the Christian is not to succeed, but to fail cheerfully. Only by that standard am I a successful Christian. <laughs> I'm a sinner who falls short of the mark again and again and again, every hour of every day. I know better, yet I fail. And a lot of folks who look like me, I'm a boringly heterosexual white southern male Episcopalian. Things work out for me in this country. But the point of the country is it's supposed to work out for everyone. The point of the gospel is that it's supposed to work out for everyone. The point of St. Thomas is that it's supposed to work out for everyone. American history is a mix of good and evil. Your life is a mix of good and evil. My life is a mix of good and evil. But we'd prefer to hear the trumpets rather than face the tragedies. We'd prefer to kind of move the uncomfortable history to the side. To do so is to dishonor the great sacrifices that have made the Republic worth defending. We have to face the tragedies, not to wallow in self-flagellation, 
but to know what we should not do and to know what we should replicate. Progress in America is always slow, bloody, painful, and provisional. The Civil War led to segregation, the New Deal to right-wing reactions, civil rights to white backlash, the presidency of Barack Obama to the corrosive politics of fear and of insurrection. We must acknowledge the truth of our past and of our present, no matter how painful. And because it's painful, we have to acknowledge it. We have to, acknowledge, we have to confront that reality in all its anguish and complexity. We must remember that history calls us to close the gap between the profession of the ideals of equality, justice, and love and the practice of those ideals. And in answering that call, one ever ancient, ever new, we should bear in mind the moral utility of history. The moral utility of remembrance is not to congratulate, but to challenge ourselves to hear and heed the still small voice of conscience, a voice that can be heard, I believe, when one is in communication with the sacraments. What's true in our own lives, that we ought to love one another as we do ourselves, is equally true in the life of the country. We're enjoined by the psalmist not to put our trust in princes, and the New Testament teaches us that all nations are of one blood. The duty of the Christian is not to force one's beliefs on anyone else, but to bear witness by living as best we can in accord with the gospel, a gospel founded on the counterintuitive conviction that the first shall be last and we're to love others as ourselves. Who wants to do that? That's hard. No, thank you. But democracy only succeeds when we choose. And it is a choice. That is the thrilling and terrifying thing. It is a choice. This is not just, this, this is not unfolding in a vacuum. To give as well as to take. The story of humankind from Eden forward suggests that most people would rather take than give. Democracy then is forever vulnerable. Yet it's also forever possible if we heed the lessons of our faith and of our history. Lessons embodied in this parish, lessons told again and again on 100,000 successive Sundays. Our faith and our history tell us this, we have moved the world toward liberty rather than tyranny. And the future belongs to the men and the women in power and far from it, who insist on giving all of us what Lincoln called an open field and a fair chance. How do we know the future belongs to such people? The people who rejoiced in hope and were patient in suffering? Because the best of the past belongs to those who did precisely that. Do this in remembrance of them. Perhaps history itself, perhaps remembrance itself, perhaps the sacraments that unfold here can offer us a path forward. It has for two centuries. And if we define history as the story of the American odyssey from limitation to possibility, from exclusion to inclusion, from constriction to opportunity, then St. Thomas will be a living institution, a part of a beating heart of a republic that loves rather than hates. And in that history, through the mercy of God, lies our hope. Thank you. now have a little bit of time for Q&A. Uh, my utmost recommendation... Q, whether Q, you get an A or an not. A. <laughs> <laughs> my utmost recommendation is uh, the questions have to be as short as possible so that the answers can be 
can leave time for the answers. Uh, and uh, I would like to start by asking you um, a question about the uh, extent to which, in a very polarized society, yep. faith has become not, on, not only as just, just as polarized, but also polarizing, uh, unfortunately. What do you think is the lesson we need to learn as Christians, and what is the imperative for us in order to uh, not fall into this trap, but also help society, our society, to be less polarized? I, I think, the, the, to me, your presence here suggests that you are open to enlisting in the cause of telling a story that I associate because of the way I was raised and, and the, with Anglicanism, that there is a way of being faithful without being coercive, that there's a way of being faithful while being loving, a way of being faithful without being closed off from the complexities and compromises that are required in a world east of Eden. One of the besetting problems in American life today is the rise of Christian nationalism, which is so fundamentally unbiblical, it's, it, it, you, you just can get the blood pressure going. Um, God shows no partiality. Do we really think that the Lord God of hosts is paying attention to a national border? That he's going to favor the people on this side of a line as opposed to this side of a line? I don't think so. I mean, I hope he's got other things to do. <laughs> so, the answer to how faith can reduce polarization is not that you take faith out of this conversation, it's that you use a, your understanding of what faith teaches you in those debates and conversations. And to me, this piece, the great piece of secular scripture in the United States is the most important sentence ever originally rendered in English, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the sentence has changed more lives around the world than any other originally rendered in English. Now that's a hyperbolic claim. It is a little like the old story about the um, Texas school board candidate who was against teaching Spanish in the public schools and said on the stump one day, if English was good enough for our Lord Jesus Christ, it's good enough for Texas. <laughs> so. <clears throat> when George W. Bush was governor, I told him that story. He said, <laughs> he said, <laughs> That's pretty funny, asshole. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, sorry. Um, and there is no health in us. Um, the answer to a form of coercive faith is not no faith, it's a tolerant faith. Thank you, thank you so much. So, uh, open to questions, yes. So my question is one that I wrestle with a lot. Um, how do you deal with close friends, family members, um, who frankly are living a different reality? Who are? are living in a different reality. Yeah. Because they're frankly, they've been brainwashed, I think, um, because of the, and I, 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 I really, my heart is broken for them, because I don't think they're bad people. They just literally don't know better. And these are educated people. Yeah. I'm sure you encounter that all the time. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Yeah. Well, I have uh, <clears throat> Mississippi in-laws who only encounter stuff I do when Fox attacks it. <laughs> so they're, they're conflicted. They don't, it's like exciting that I'm, you know, that they're, I'm big enough to be attacked, but they sort of agree with the attackers. It's very complicated. <laughs> um, it's really hard. You know, it's funny, that question I teach at Vanderbilt, which we call the Sewanee of Middle Tennessee. Um, 
I had maybe a half dozen students ask me that before Thanksgiving last year because they were going home to that, right? Um, the way I do it is I say it's a big, complicated, disputatious country. And I use something I call obituary management. I say, all I'm going to say about all this is think out what, in the fullness of time, which side do you want to have been on? Right? There's not a single, well, there, may be, there may be some, but I come from a moderate white southern world, right? There's almost nobody who today does not wish they had been on the Edmund Pettus Bridge on the 7th of March, 1965, right? To have been with John Lewis and Hosea Williams, to have been there, to have faced white supremacists, possumen and deputies. Who would not want to be part of that hinge of history, that bending of the arc of a moral universe? But there weren't a lot of people, were there? So what I like to say is take a deep breath and think about it. Is this really the bus you want to stay on? It has no effect, but it gives you, I think, to me the best. It's, it's the only conversational way in because nobody, as Lincoln said, no one likes having it pointed out that there's a difference of purpose between themselves and the Almighty. Right? No one wants to be told they're wrong, ever. And I understand that. I don't want to be told I'm wrong. And I, I've been, th oh God, God, I've been through this in every way you can think of. I've over-criticized uh, the loyalists of the 45th president. Um, I've, I've popped off. One of the besetting problems for people like me is even if you don't have something to say, you sometimes have to say something. <laughs> and that's a problem. It requires a discipline to say, oh, I don't know. Play a drinking game. Have a big, big drink the next time you see someone on television say, I don't really have an opinion about that. <laughs> You'll be sober forever. Good afternoon. A question. When, you, when we talk about history, I mean, history at its best is dispassionate and nostalgia is emotional. How do you, given that that seems to be the conflict, nostalgia versus history, how do you get history to reclaim the proper narrative of, of the nation? It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think when people say they want to make America great again, my question is what what point is it that we were so great that you want to go back to that, right? I have a good friend who says that one way to understand the difference between President, former President Trump and President, uh, I just violated my rule and said it, but, uh, and President Biden is that uh, to some extent, the former president wants to take us back to 1955 and the incumbent president likes 1965. <laughs> a really good way to put it. And I give credit to my friend because he thought of it and it really annoys me that I didn't think of it. <laughs> um, you just tell the story. You have to tell the story. You don't, this is one thing, you don't let, don't let, what, if you think that there is, someone is saying that some, something that is wrong, factually wrong, don't let it go by. Because that, that, you, you might not be able to change their opinions, but you can hopefully make a case for fact, right? And so, look, this is a, I've given my, I, I spend my life writing about the American experience. Um, but think about, we have spent vastly, 
a, a vastly larger percentage of the national experience of the United States of America has been spent out of compliance with our own mission statement than in compliance, right? So the question becomes, how do we get in compliance? If the mission statement is the Declaration of Independence, which is a secular version of a biblically based, I believe, and you all, I think most of you believe, understanding of human identity and human dignity. The Constitution is the user's guide, right? Mission statement, user's guide. And I think people think they know American history, but they don't actually. Most people don't. And what I find, which is reassuring to your question, sir, is that if you have a, if you have a fact check, people, if, if, if they don't listen to that, like if, if someone says to you, oh, if only it could be like 1950, everything was great. I'd say, well, not if you were a woman, gay, or of color. Not so great. Women have voted for 100 years in this country, so less than half. In my native region, black Americans have had the vote three years longer than I've been alive. We have a debate, you know, about, was it 1619 or 1776? It's actually the wrong debate. This country was founded in 1965, right? The Immigration and Nationality Act, which undid the 1924 restrictive immigration signed by President Johnson at Governor's Island in the summer, and the Voting Rights Act, that's the first integrated electorate in American history. It was 55 years ago, 20 minutes ago, historically. And a lot of the backlash we're seeing is because of that, I think. The, the pithy answer after a long-winded one is, if you hear a story that you think is wrong, tell your story. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Oh, you're the French woman. Yes. Sorry about that. We really do appreciate the revolution. I swear. I have a serious question. Yes, I read all of your books, by the way. Thank you. The question is, is faith taught or is it inherited? Repeat the question. Yeah, we can't hear it. Well, it's too hard, so I don't want to repeat it. <laughs> Rector, get ready. This, this may be for you. Is faith taught or is it inherited? What you got, baby? <laughs> well... <laughs> Interestingly, uh, faith is uh, seen as a set of beliefs, like your constitution. Faith, we are taught in the scriptures, is a gift from God. Faith's faith a gift is... from God. I, I was just thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, faith is a gift, yes. Um, it's why I believe in the sacraments, because I think if you put yourself, this is my personal one man's opinion. I find in my own life that if I put myself in the way of faith, my bet is that I am more likely to receive that gift. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is basically, um, American democracy is as we know, truly unique in the world. Amer American democracy is unique in the world. But how do you reconcile our democracy, one person, one vote, with the corruption that we see today in politics and in the political discourse? I think we live in a fallen, frail, and fallible world. I think that 
To me, democracy is an imperfect answer. Where'd you go? There you are. Um, to an imperfect world. It's, it's, it's the best we've come up with. And is corruption real? Absolutely. Parenthetically, um, it's very interesting. There's so much, so much of our language about statecraft and politics from the ancients comes from the language of healthcare. Corruption meant disease. Right? It comes from Hippocrates. Crisis is the moment in a disease where a patient lives or dies. It comes from Hippocrates. The body politic. Um, it is a sign of how the ancients understood that our common life was so vital. It is a pagan answer, it is a pagan version of the uh, Augustinian um, uh, insight from the city of God. Um, it is never going to be perfect, but as Winston Churchill said, it's the worst of all forms of government except for all the others. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I think we can all acknowledge over the last 25 years that leaders of Western democracies have become more secular, at least in their posture, um, at least in their posturing. Um, I guess my question is to what extent Will faith or lack of faith characterize the American presidency in the next 25 years? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so to, to what extent would the language and vernacular of faith characterize the presidency, public life? It's hard because you do have this sense that there's a sense in the center and the left of American politics that the most overt religious involvement in politics is clearly associated with the right. I've lost track of where I was gesturing. Um, my strong view, as, I, as we were just talking about, is that you cannot see this to any one segment. The, one of the great stories, one of the fascinating stories of American politics in the last quarter century has been the, I'm speaking very generally, has been the broad evangelical move, white evangelical move to support the MAGA movement. And it comes, I believe, people who've watched it closely believe that those folks believe their world is under siege. And even if they have an imperfect defender, to say the least, th he's their defender. I understand that, that's elemental. Right? But you one, if one believes in the Declaration, and again, I'm not a partisan, okay? I'm really not. I do believe that this moment in American life requires a particular partisan vote to preserve a constitutional order, something I never thought I would believe, but self evidently, I think that's true. Again, I'm I'm George Bush's biographer. I'm, I'm, AOC is not going to be challenged. I'm not going to challenge her out there, right? I mean, this is not, I mean, look at, okay? I mean, this is not Marxist here. But I believe, but I believe this. And I'm privileged to be able to do it, okay? I'm not, you know, I, I don't have a particular policy passion. I'm lucky. I'm on the right side of the economic and cultural equation. You know, I, I have the liberty to say voting for the incumbent president is a vote for the constitutional order and I think that's the most important thing. And I do. 
But I understand that people, other, your relatives and the folks who tell you stories you disagree with, I understand why they feel this way. The only way to, I think, bring them closer to what I hope they would think is not to tell but to show. You can't tell people, you got to show them. And that's why I use the Pettus Bridge example. Where do you want to have been? Right? Do you really want, is this the general you want to follow into battle? I didn't answer your question. Um, I think that there'll be an instinct uh, on the center left to avoid this. I think that would be a mistake. In this room, in this church, with all of us together, I feel very hopeful. But I have to confess to you that out there, I feel a lot of hopelessness, that my vote counts, that rationality counts, that lots, lots of other things that we agree on in this room count. My question to you is, do you have any thoughts to inspire or to directly give advice on how to maintain hope in the outside world and maybe one or two things practically that we can do to maintain hope? I do have hope because we've come this far, and it would have surprised the founders that we did. Um, before he was a musical, Alexander Hamilton was um, a really good political philosopher. And in this city, wrote a chunk of the Federalist Papers, worried about demagogues, worried about chaos, worried about reappearing tyranny and oppression. And the fact that it took two and a half centuries to get there, I think, would have surprised him. I'll tell you a quick story about, uh, so I, I'm a Jefferson biographer. Um, we won our own musical, by the way. Uh, <laughs> be a lot, it would help a lot. Um, but, but I guess it was 10 years ago or so I did that book. And I got a call um, one day from Chris Christie, who was in The Governor, and he said, I was like, would you come have lunch? I want to talk to you about Jefferson. You do whatever Christie says. Um, he's Sicilian. Um, <clears throat> so I went to Trenton, and we're sitting there, and he said, well, you know, I'm really more a Hamilton kind of guy, which really just means you're an investment banker. That's what that means. <laughs> uh, but I said, uh, I really wasn't, I wasn't trying to be glib. I just said, well, you know, that's great, Governor, but at least my guy didn't get shot in Jersey. <laughs> And the damnedest thing happened, I couldn't get back into the city, all the bridges. <laughs> um, Chris Christie, by the way, Chris Christie is now, I believe, in a class with Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and others for having stood up, sacrificed his own political viability to do the right thing. So, God love him. Um, uh, hope. Um, Vote, because it does count. I mean, you vote in New York? Okay, well, you're, you, you don't have to then. Uh, <laughs> I'm in Tennessee, so I don't either. Uh, we have, we've come this far by the skin of our teeth. And it's always going to be by the skin of our teeth. It shouldn't be quite so hard, but you know what? He went through a lot. I think we can handle, you know, this. Um, practically, do you know anybody in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, or Michigan? Call them every day. <laughs> I mean that. I mean that. This election will be decided by about a million people over six or seven states, and none of them are here, I suspect. Anybody here live in any of those states? Where do you live? Pennsylvania. Okay. God love you, please. You know, James Carville once described Pennsylvania as Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and Alabama in between. Right? 
Which, which part are you? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Okay, you're fine. <laughs> that was a risky roll of the dice, gang. <laughs> that could have gone south really fast. I mean that. I mean that. Um, you know, give money to get out the voter. I mean, you can figure all that out. You don't need me for that. We can get through this, but it's not going to be automatic. It's not going to just happen. And again, that's the thrilling and terrifying thing. It's thrilling because it's up to us, and it's terrifying because it's like, oh, Jesus, it's up to us. Sorry. <laughs> How are we doing? John is to, Is it 5 uh, o'clock yet? What is it's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of almost 12.30. Almost 12.30. One more, and then we'll go. One more question. OK. <clears throat> My um, ninth grade daughter has a winter formal tonight in Nashville, Tennessee. I have to get back to because I have to clean my shotgun. <laughs> How do we protect and elevate the fourth estate? Sorry? How do we protect and maybe even elevate the fourth estate? Oh, the fourth estate. Um, it's, that's a great question. Um, all right, so very quickly. When we all grew up, more or less, yeah, um, there was the press. The press and the media were kind of the same thing, right? That's not true anymore. We are all now part of the media. Any of you with that machine you have in your pocket can say something, be part of a conversation that used to be quite limited to people who had jobs like I had, right? So everyone is now part of this buzzing town square, what William James called the blooming, buzzing confusion of reality. Um, the press is different. The press is our institutions that have economic and cultural incentives to either report in a kind of neutral way or to report and interpret and promulgate in a partisan way. And one of the realities, and it unfolded while I was a parishioner, a communicant of this church, almost exactly, come to think of it, the economic and cultural incentives changed fundamentally. When I, I, I'm, I'm a dinosaur, a unicorn, something. Um, I went into the print journalism business. It's like being the, you know, the best restaurant in a hospital. You know, you don't want to do it. Um, but I did it. And we had a, our, our newspapers, magazines, networks had an economic model that was based on mass. Right? So if you were a pharmaceutical company, a car company, insurance company, Prudential, piece of the rock, you know, you would advertise because you wanted to get the most number of people. That's been flipped. One of the reasons the, both the digital and the cable world is so narrow cast now is because you want to go to, adver advertisers want to know exactly who they're reaching. And so it's not in anyone's incentive, it's not in incentivized to be on the one hand, on the other hand. And parenthetically, that's not true, right? There's not, there are not two, there are many sides to all questions, but there aren't legitimate sides to all questions, right? And we've all watched people tie themselves in knots about this. But one side attacked the Capitol and one side didn't. Pretty straightforward, right? And so I believe in subscribing to, if, if, if there are outlets, uh, the action item is, if there are outlets that do what you think is good for debate, dialogue, Subscribe, right? Very few of us, I mean, we all spend all our money on Netflix and Hulu and all that. Give some to the more serious items. 
Um, I just want to say thank you to uh, uh, Father Turner and, and Father Joya for um, rolling the dice on letting me talk to you. Uh, it could have gone either way. The first time I spoke in a church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, probably 25 years ago, as I was getting up, the rector reached out and held my arm and said, please, please, whatever you do, lose no annual givers. <laughs>